Hey there, I'm Logan Medish, and this is High Caliber History. On October 7th, 1879, John Moses Browning was issued U.S. Patent Number 220,271 for a breech-loading firearm. It was the first of more than 120 arms-related patents that would be issued to him until his death in 1926. That first patent had its beginnings a year earlier in 1878, when John Moses was working as a gunsmith for his father, Jonathan. He told his father that he could design a better gun than the one that he'd been tasked to repair, and his father essentially told him to put his money where his mouth was, and so he did. In less than a year, the design and prototype for Browning's first gun had been completed. It was no easy task. John didn't have access to a milling machine, so all of the work was done on an anvil and refined with files. Then, of course, he had to submit the patent application. Now, that was a process he knew nothing about, so he relied on a jobbing house in New York to put him in touch with a patent attorney. His letter to the attorney was simple. Please tell me how to patent a gun and oblige, he wrote. On May 12, 1879, he submitted his patent application and a scale model. Less than five months later, he received his patent and production began on what was known as the Browning Single Shot Rifle. The patent model is now part of the National Firearms Collection at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. John, along with his brothers, began making and selling the rifle at their shop in Ogden, Utah. Over the course of the next three years, the Browning brothers produced 600 rifles and sold them for $25 each. Sales were good, but reach was limited. After all, this was Utah in the 1880s. With the exception of Salt Lake City, they were more than a thousand miles from any truly major city. And that all changed when a Winchester salesman named Andrew McCausland stumbled upon one of the Browning brothers' rifles at some point in his travels in 1883. The gun he saw was serial number 463. McCausland paid $15 for the rifle and, recognizing the potential that it had, he sent it back to the Winchester Company's New Haven headquarters for examination. It was there that Vice President T.G. Bennett was shown the rifle. Almost immediately, he set out from Connecticut for Utah, a trip that would take at least five days, with instructions from the board of directors that he was to buy the rights for the gun, whatever the cost. Initially, John told him that the cost would be $10,000. The men dickered, and eventually a deal was struck between Bennett and Browning to the tune of $8,000. Adjusted for inflation, that's almost a quarter of a million today. For that sum, Browning sold the manufacturing rights for his rifle to Winchester. They renamed it the Model 1885 and produced it in a dizzying number of calibers. The rifle's single-shot, falling-block design was a hit with target shooters of the era. Not only were they very accurate, but the gun's action was one of the most solid ever designed. This meant that it could certainly easily handle small rimfire calibers in its low-wall configuration, but it could just as easily withstand large calibers like the 5090 Sharps in the more robust high wall con uh, configuration. When production halted in 1920, 140,000 Model 1885 rifles had been sold. That works out to about 4,000 rifles a year for 35 years. That's quite the improvement for the brothers' output of 200 handmade rifles per year. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of High Caliber History. I hope you learned something about early Browning history. And if you did, uh, please give a thumbs up to this video, drop a comment below, uh, subscribe if you're not, share this with someone you think would like it, and we'll see you right here on the next episode of High Caliber History.